Who is Manu Joseph? I think I'm, I am a prankster. Are Plus, you playing a prank? Not right, right now? now, not right now. <laughs> really did not hit on any girl. No, that was a great misfortune in my life. I went to a boys' school. Anu Joseph is fundamentally a contrarian. There's nothing that kinky about me at all. At what point did you want to be a journalist? I feel that the origin of all writers, no matter what they claim. The reason my generation got to know Manu Joseph was the Radia tapes. He wrote a piece in defense of Tarun Tejpa. In fact, Tarun Tej was quite a jerk to me. Were you a liberal? I feel that I surrendered my rationality to an idea that people are generally good and only good things should happen. Welcome to Off Limits, the New Indians platform where we try to seek answers for the questions that lie in the grey zone and are away from the dominant public discourse. Today we have with us Manu Joseph. As usual, I am not going to introduce the subject because we need to know who really Manu Joseph is and he will reveal it to you himself. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on your show. Manu, my first question. Let's say I don't know you, although I do know you, and I have a certain image of you, but let's keep that aside. I want you to tell us who is Manu Joseph and whatever this Manu Joseph is, whatever entity, creature it is, how did it become Manu Joseph? <laughs> But I must say, when it's a somewhat esoteric question for me, um, because when, I, as a journalist, when I would uh, listen to people talk about themselves in um, in mysterious ways, you know, as a young journalist, I I used to meet a lot of celebrities, a lot of famous people, and I also figured that there was a point when you can actually make them say something esoteric about themselves, like, who are you, you yeah. know? It's like, who are you? you yeah. And say it was like, who are you? <laughs> and I was like, and I would always be amazed at how people were willing to search for something abstract about them, Yeah. you know? And I think that brings us to one part of me, but it's a very small part of me. I think I'm, I am a prankster in the sense that I used to enjoy watching people search for the abstract, you know. So there was an amusement in me. So this was and ever was, since ever since you were a child? This, uh, in terms of formal questioning, the opportunity for formal questioning uh, was only uh, as a journalist, chiefly in my early 20s. I became a full-time journalist at 20. But even during my teenage, I, I could see that uh, you can lead people down a path in a conversation uh, where you, uh, you you can just then watch you have them the upper entertain you. You have the upper hand and you can manipulate them to think what you want them to think. You know, what was interesting was how easy it is to be underestimated in a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, because the, uh, like, like anybody else, I, I I wanted to impress, so to be impressive, right? But, but where I, did this come from, Manu? Just tell us, like, was it innate? Did you get it inherited from your parents, from your family, or the environment that you were raised? What happened, like, where were you born and raised? And what are your parents like? Are you their shadow? Are you a manifestation of their genetics? Well, I want to say, I hope, uh, I hope not, but then I have to explain um, myself in great detail. I was born in Kerala, uh, but I, I believe fortunately for me, I was, I was taken to Madras when I was six months old. Um, and uh, Madras is a very underrated city, you know, in the sense that uh, it's, it's, a re it's really a big city in a very Indian way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very ancient. Uh, I want to use the word tribal, you know, and uh, uh, 
so it you so i i kind of enjoyed uh, i enjoyed the memory of growing up in madras though i didn't enjoy the process of growing up in madras when i was there but as a memory it's like a very difficult hike you don't enjoy the when you're doing it but the memory is very pleasant mm -hmm. so uh, so madras was a bit like that and madras is a dramatic city you know like i'd like to say one a dialect of tamil is hysteria you know and there was just drama all the time around me and uh, so that drama had effect on your personality would you say that i would say that uh, uh, i i used to my, my my most fluent language was tamil uh, even though my mother tongue was malayalam i used to speak better tamil than uh, english and we all i don't know my generation we go through a time oh we know god we have to speak good english or because all the uh, posh girls spoke english or english is required for life and then i i was among that generation which thought in indian languages you know i always but strangely so i always hoped in, in english you went to school in madras in madras yeah we it called was it called madras, madras. Yeah. yeah it was even then it was called madras yeah but around 16 i discovered western culture in the sense that so till 16 you were completely ignorant i would say uh, my my chief influence is like i could call, count the english films i have seen you know t uh, till i was 16 it was in fact what i thought were english films are all actually bruce lee films which are actually not english films and i must have seen five or six films and and half of them would have uh, had silvester stallone in the lead right and then you discover the novels i i, I had read uh, uh, already the, the like uh, jeffrey archer types and all that but but when i was 16 things just escalated in terms of what you read and uh, you uh, you intellectually you become so westernized so till sixteen you thought you were a madrasi when you are authentically yourself and which is what we were at one point before all of us transformed we never thought so much about ourselves in a context it was just the place you grew up in fact nobody was a patriot when i was growing up you know it was just understood that you just live in this place though of course you also were supposed to get out of that place but you never spoke about your existence in passionate terms so maybe that that would be the chief difference between you and me because my home was so assured and so unremarkable you know and every day was almost the same and in madras actually every day was also the same in fact i refuse to believe there is a place in india which is actually too cold because to me india was a tropical country and i thought even cold weather was a rumor right it is that oh back in kashmir we thought that there are only two uh, uh, regions in the world actually one was kashmir and then the other was madras <laughs> <laughs> you know between kashmir and madras i think we would 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 cover you know uh, yes. the the world you know let's get back to this being a prankster uh, having this whole notion that you can manipulate people and you can play pranks though there's a difference between uh, playing a prank and manipulating you know i think uh, prank is manipulation by good people you know i would like to put it that <laughs> you way would because you like to believe it <laughs> because manipulation has an objective which is beyond amusement and that moment and it has a certain kind of uh, kind of seriousness it's like it's a power that you're not supposed to use you know in fact uh, uh it's related to what what you're trying to get at is that i i i find that some of the nicest people that you can meet you know are just people who have lost the power right the real value of a person would be when that person has the power how that person was right this is applicable to parents or anybody you know so people and it's very easy to be a good person without the power and manipulation is one of those things that only people with power can use so it's in a completely different it's the opposite of uh the part of me which i like okay which is just a, very simple pure amusement at the world uh which i don't want to change i have so no strong opinion so you're basically saying that even as a child there was this moral compass 
connected to being this prankster you were and somewhere your upbringing or the environment taught you that moral compass, the compass of being good and just having amusement and not really causing any harm to anyone. Yeah, the moral compass came from Christianity. I had a very strong Christian upbringing by my very moralistic mom. Uh, and uh, so like, like most people of my generation, I was brought up by my mom. And that has its own consequences, <laughs> which was, and in fact, I became an atheist at 11 in the church, when suddenly for no reason at all, I thought, now what? This is bullshit. Why? This makes no sense. Actually, it is very logical for a child to be a believer because you take photosynthesis. You have no idea what's going on, but you believe it because a lot of things that you, that, that, that you know or you hear, you don't understand it fully, but you know that's the truth. And God becomes a part of that. You know, and it's like photosynthesis, okay, I don't fully get it, but I accept, you know. Sun, okay, it takes eight minutes to reach me, the light. I don't fully get it, but I, I accept that. Gravity at that time, I thought elders knew, and only I didn't know. I didn't know that nobody knew what gravity was at that point. And then God, maybe it makes sense, right? It makes sense because our first philosophical question is, where does space end? And you know that logic is not as logical as people think claim it is. But then in church, it, it was, so that was the end of Christianity for me. But there is a big difference. Once the, the moral foundation, that's why I always feel your childhood is your real caste. Your childhood is your re, real religion. So the moral compass was, was very strong. And at that time, in its own simple provincial way, you know, I have no great respect for Madras in intellectual terms or anything like that. It was not a, it was not a complex place. Everything was simple and, you know, morality was also like, it was like that, you know, being a good person, you're basically being judgmental about everybody who is not you, right? So the, the fundamental quality of mor morality is staring at people who are not you. You know, that is the visual representation of morality to me. And that was what Madras was. Madras was always gawking from the window, you know, at the world outside. And you know that they are forming an opinion. Like once a sweeper had discovered a glove, one glove. And it was such an odd sight that the whole colony stood and watched. And a North Indian girl, as I've mentioned in one of my books, she goes in jeans, everybody will stop and watch because nobody, not many people used to wear jeans. Uh, and this is just 80s, I'm not as old as I look. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, the sleeveless blouse, the woman is a sleeveless blouse and uh, it's somehow linked to melancholy, you know. And all those things in the air you catch as a child, you know, and that all rich people are sad. And all rich people are smugglers. So all these observations that you've been putting in your novels, in your essays, and you have you identified yourself as a journalist and a prankster. So all these attributes or whatever you become, this is all because of the childhood, the experience in Madras. Would you say that? I don't know. I, I, I don't know because uh, uh, if, if, for example, I had a very uh, formidable uh, cultural grounding, let's say like a Bengali upper middle class child in Calcutta, okay, where you uh, belong to that place and everything is about the place and you're taught to be proud of that place and that uh, uh, deep down you suspect that you're the best. Uh, maybe, maybe I would have, I would have, maybe I would have been retarded, you know, I don't know, or maybe I would have been a better person. There's no way you can tell that. But what was good, uh, what I like about, I, the thing is, I, I do like uh, everything about myself. So maybe I just like where I grew up also, though I have no romantic notions about it. It is just that it was blank, that I could, I could just, you're always, in, you're also an outsider. Okay, at the same time, they, there is no so you, you powerful did, you, force which is trying to change you. 
people think that writers are always observing, okay? And a lot of writers also start believing that they are great observers. In fact, one writer told me, okay, during an interview that he, he goes to a pub in Bombay and he sits and he observes because he has started believing the romantic notions that, that writers sit and observe. But what is observation? Observation is not the act of seeing. Observation is the memory of seeing and a bit of it is a corrupt memory of seeing also because you kind of adjust a few things for your own maturity, right? So, uh, so, so Medra's contribution would be that where, I, for example, I strongly believe, uh, and in fact, this is one of those fundamental principles in which, uh, which guides my writing, is that there is the villager and there is a city person. They're what are you? Are you the villager? I'm, I'm the, the city person. I, 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 the only thing is I used to be very proud of being the city person. But now I have a compassionate view for the villager because I just realized that what, what I thought was global culture was just the local culture of influential white people, which it's a realization that you get much later. And then there is nothing wrong with that, okay? That it is, but it is, still, uh, uh, it, it is still someone's local culture, which you thought was a human condition. There is no cultural human condition is the lesson that you learn. Uh, so I have, a, I, I have a more compassionate view for the village and the idea of the home and, and to overrate so your own I culture. You, where is your home? I would say that I, I, uh, I don't feel at home anywhere, you know, and uh, there are times uh, when earlier, I mean, even five years ago, I would feel more at home in a place like London or other places like, as a cultural orphan. I used to enjoy the call myself a cultural orphan and enjoy it, but I think that's a lot of bullshit, you know. So I, I feel at home mostly only in my physical home with my family, you know, in that sense as a family villager uh, makes a lot of sense to me, but otherwise culturally, Gurga was the last place I identify with and I've been here for the last 12 years. And uh, I used to find Bombay, uh, I'm very, very comfortable in Bombay, but uh, but though because I've lived in the Chols and all that, I know that Bombay is, eventually, is essentially either a Maharashtrian place, depending on where you are, or a Gujarati place where you are, you know. That is the true character of the place, and a lot of people who use words like cosmopolitan and all that are people who are just uh, uh, trying to observe on the surface, you know. The fundamental character of Bombay, Bombay has a very strong character, so uh, the more you know that city, the less of a home it feels. So, um, tell us at least, let's say, three big pranks that you played on people in your childhood or even in adulthood which you think like were exceptional to you yourself and you thought that you are like the greatest prankster on the world in the world actually i played one great prank I, I when i was 20 and i just got this job i was in a lodge in kerala and there was this roommate uh, that i had who was new it was just a few days and he, uh, he was very rude to me about the way I kept the room. Like he, when I occupied, it was on a sharing basis. When I occupied the room, he was out of town. Then he walked in and he was a big man, like a 30 year old guy, he's a proper adult. Okay. And I was a 20 year old guy. And he said that this is not the how. And then he took my belt to clean uh, his shelf and all that. And I could never sleep those days. I would wake up and I used to walk uh, miles in the night. I used to do that in Madras and I used to do that in Cochin also. So again, it was just, you just keep uh, waking up and leaving thing it very loud and all that. So I told him the next evening that uh, I, and, and, and I basically like this, like I'm just saying, because I, some, for some reason, uh, I, I apparently have a poker face. I don't know that, but, uh, so what I told him was that I, I, I wake up and right from my teenage, I have this desire to take a heavy object and bash the face of the person in the room. And I leave because I don't want to do that. Okay. So he, he was a 30 year old guy. 
And he, and, and he, I know when I got, because it always happened, I always say it, I always position myself between the person and the door, okay? It just gives you a psychological edge, mm -hmm. okay? Because the person feels vulnerable. And, uh, and uh, so I just told him and I never looked him in the eye. You know, I did all those things, which I didn't read about. I just know that these things work. And he was... Uh, he got really frightened, you know, he got really frightened. Uh, and he, uh, though the first thing he, he wanted to say was not whether I was kidding or something. He, I don't remember what he said, but it was like, and then I started laughing, you know, which is my biggest, uh, the reason why I'm not a very talented prankster is that I can't hold. You give it away? I give it away too early. <laughs> but the real prank is something which I never, that person would never know, ever. So that I prank that? them all the, very often, right? Where in the conversation, see, like it's something as simple Are you as, playing a prank? Not right? right now, not right now. Tell us, when did you start getting into reading books, writing? You said at the age of 16, you suddenly discovered the Western literature. Yeah. Uh, what were the influences? Who were the influences? It starts with British literature, the books that, that are with you and which you never read, which, which you saw you know, uh, but, you know, we, we used to have Saki and uh, uh, Shakespeare and O. Henry and all these people who I, oh, so I'm never going to read. And then you, you just casually start reading it. Uh, but then eventually what I enjoyed was the, what I call the middle brow American fiction. And then Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, uh, like, I didn't know that it, you, you can do that. You know, that, that there's so much playful mm. style that you can use. Though I read only Midnight Children, though I think the satanic verses had just exploded then and that is what uh, introduced me to his work, if I'm not mistaken. So that is, and then I started, but what actually influenced me more was the science nonfiction like Cosmos, Carl Sagan's Cosmos, uh, the book. Uh, and Stephen he, uh, Hawking, which I actually used to read, you know, completely, you know, and I kind of... You kind of related to them? Kind of found it very... Funny, I, witty. I, I didn't use the word uh, philosophy then, but I actually probably what I discovered was that it's very philosophical, you know, that science is philosophical, something which you never guess from school, the way they teach you. So I kind of started enjoying it and then I realized this level of complexity is very different from what I'm exposed to, you know, and then you immediately surrender to the Western intellectual world. Yeah. You know, because... Yeah. You find them superior. Because, yeah, you just you just thought, obviously, you know, that they've done all this and then you're not introduced to your own stuff and wherever one old uncle will say, they, you know, we are so great and then you see that, you want to read it, you know, you yeah. reach out, but then you say, okay, you know, what is that? But... Actually, it is interesting that it happened because around the time there was a very powerful counterweight. What yeah. counterweight? Just before I turned 17, I went on this, uh, I, I went to my friend's house. He was my classmate for all life. Uh, he was a quiet, uh, it was a quiet back, backbencher, you know. Uh, we used to play chess and just talk during the summer vacation, you know. Um, this was between my 12th and my first year. I was one year younger for my class. So I was generally, I was 16 when I walked into college, you know, okay. to some were kind of a clerical error. I was not clever. It was just my mom wanted to get rid of me, you know, <laughs> fast. Um, were you meritorious? No, not really, you know, not at all. Um, so, uh, so we were playing chess and then he... Um, he suddenly said, uh, we were alone, his parents used to work. So he said, um, uh, you know, um, it's exactly, start, uh, maybe actually it's interesting that you're asking, though this was a serious moment, it was the, one of the most terrifying moments in my life because he said that, well, he's a regular guy, I knew all my life and suddenly he kept looking at me and then he said that things are not what they seem. Everything is very different, you know. 
And the scariest part was I immediately got what he was saying. This is all he said. And immediately got what he was saying. And the first thing I did was I turned to, know, to place the door. For some reason, I was very terrified uh, because he looked mad. At the same time, I knew that it was something paranormal, that the world that we see is not real. And I just wanted to flee, though he was physically smaller than me. you know. Uh, so maybe I never connected it before. Maybe this moment could also influence that, that the way I, I, I set up something yeah, and, your, your, your and, and scare people, you know, your so I pranks. never, because I could feel the terror <clears throat> in just connecting, suddenly bringing a paranormal element uh, into... So you, you were in a way alluding to the argument that we often hear that India has had this wealth of knowledge which talks about pa whether you want to call it paranormal, metaphysical, um, things which are now being looked at in yes. the West. India's ownership is what I find amusing. Okay, I feel that at that moment I was I was this, you know, I was I was the Indian spiritual patriot. Okay, I believed because I was also going through a dark period in my life, you know, which I don't want to elaborate. It was just a very s sad phase, and suddenly someone telling me that everything is bullshit, there is something out there. I just got it immediately, I just, I just wanted to believe it. And even today I can see that how a clever handler can do it to a teenager and make him a terrorist, okay, in a different context, okay, that something better out there, that what your, your reality is not the real world, is a very powerful idea if you are a teenager and you're going through a phase. Then we got into it, major conversation, that we built, or he transferred it to me. He transmitted the idea and I, I got everything. And he was saying that nobody, everybody else thinks I'm mad. You're the only guy who takes me seriously, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I believed that, Indian, uh, that, that Hindu philosophy held a secret, that it's a code, that it has, just like a temple has very pretty material things on the outside to lure people in. And deeper and deeper you go, the more uh, odd the aesthetics become because it's, me, it's talking about something else. Yeah. Similarly, everything about Hinduism is like starts as a story, but it is depending on your intellectual depth, you can go deep and find meaning. This is, a, is something which I, I thought, I believed it. For many years of it, it, it saved me through my 20s, you know. What you don't I would, believe in it now? I don't believe in it now. I, I have a completely different idea now that uh, it, is, it is chiefly on the spectrum of mental health, you know, and uh, that belief itself is possible only uh, for people with a certain kind of, uh, a particular kind of mental health. I don't want to say mental disability because I do not know whether it's a disability or a superpower, you know. But it is a mental condition of your mind. Um, and I feel that we have a lot of names and labels now in psychiatry to explain almost everything that I've encountered in the name of spirituality uh, from age of 16 till actually late 20s. You know, I, I, I was pursuing this so this when, oneness. So when teenagers generally are into relationships, dating, you were into spirituality? Not out of choice, because in Madras you just don't date if you're, in a, if you're a middle class guy, you know. So you really did not hit on any girl in the school? No, that was a great misfortune in my life. I went to a boys school. Oh. And there were girls all around, but the, the colony girls, you don't ask them out. I mean, it was unheard of. You know, at least in my social circle, I know that I'm, I'm making it look like the 18th century, but I think it was in a way, right? You're because, right. No, it's true for it's yeah, true for us. Yeah, it's a great regret of my life because I don't think. I mean, I think you should just accept that loss. You know, that, and uh, you know, probably in your teenage, you're also probably looking your best, and you're the most glorious, and and you're anonymous. Anonymous in the only way you can be anonymous, that is anonymous to girls. You know, it really didn't matter to me that, you know, that my classmates knew me, you know. 
So, uh, so that was a misfortune. And then I went but, to a boys' but, college. But would you say that you were a romantic in your teenage? I would say I was, uh, I was, I was very romantic. Because I was also, in a way, you know, I was also a good person. You know, I could, I could see that uh, I was just wanting to be practical, okay, which is a word that I want to use when you don't want to be good. But I was, I knew the theory, but I was also there, you know, where for a very brief period of time, I could just be very, uh, I could, I could, uh, you know, I, I, like my heart would beat faster just at the sight of, of, a, of a girl, right? And I would never understand why it doesn't happen with someone else, because in terms of features, they all seem to be same, same, but it is, just happens with this. But so at, at what point did you really uh, get into relationships? I'm very ashamed to say 20, you know? Okay. Uh, so, so I didn't have a girlfriend uh, till I was uh, uh, till I was twenty, you know that I was. Uh, so I think a, a problem also was that one I didn't. Now when I look back, I I didn't realize that was interest from a girl. Like, if, for example, someone is losing their textbook all the time, and coming to your house. Let's say as an example, mm -hmm. I I would have never guessed. I never believed, first of all, that girls liked boys. You oh, know? yeah. I just thought it's something yeah. which only boys uh, You're not the only one. I had the same idea that girls don't like boys. Oh, you did? <laughs> so it's probably confirmed. It's true. Yes. Let's say now you are in this age where you have accepted that, okay, men and women fall in love with each other. Uh, so who was your ideal woman? What kind of a woman could fall for you or you would fall for her? No, nobody could fall for me. I'm, as a teenager, I, that was out of the question and, and maybe the sense that the, the possibility of that happening, that flattery was exciting, you know? But deep down, I never thought that that happens to boys. There were two, uh, there were two uh, visual representation of girls for me. And this is in the context of a schoolboy, otherwise it sounds creepy. One was the blue pinafer of Adarsh Vidyalaya school, okay? So it is, a, it is a particular visual representation of beauty. And, the, and our neighboring school, Fatima school, uh, was slightly, uh, I mean, it, like my uh, fantasies were slightly affected because my sister also went there, oh. right? So there was that confusion there. But otherwise, these, this, these were the schoolgirls we saw all the time and... Uh, Who were in traditional clothes? No, and, no, no, they were in uh, not exactly traditional clothes. They were in, they had this olive green skirt, pleated skirt and white shirt. So, okay. so they, but they, some of them could make it the way they wore it. You wouldn't think it's skirt and shirt. You know, some people have that capacity in India to wear it, you know. So either they do something to the skirt, so I don't know. They tried to de-glamorize the girls. But the biggest secret of Madras at that time were what we used to call the Marwadi girls, who were just the moneylenders' daughters, who were always, uh, we knew that, you know, they were, like, particularly attractive, right? So these were the three broad, broad representations, categories. right? And at what point did you uh, discover that you wanted to be a journalist, a writer? Um, and you were going to pursue a path, perhaps, which was very different from the path other boys or other friends had chosen. Yeah, this happened early. Uh, uh, by 14, 15, I had decided uh, that I'm going to be a writer, and uh, partly because my father uh, was a journalist and a film writer and, uh, and all that. Um, and I used to write poems and speeches and I used to do what was called mono acting. And, uh, uh, and I feel that the origin of all writers, no matter what they claim, is actually quite uh, lowbrow in the sense that you just get a lot of compliments. It's a very overvalidated profession as it is. And that overvalidation is what happens earlier. And then you, you want to stick to it because you think you're good at it. And uh, it is the power so of So you are compliment. smitten by the glamour attached to the profession. Yeah, I, you're right. Glamour is the word, you know. People, like, I, I didn't know it was not so glamorous. At that time, I, 
and of course I was reading books. But I thought you just said that it's over glamorous and over, over validated. Over it's over validated. Yeah, it had that uh, glamour which attracted me. Yeah. I didn't know that it was glamorous in other ways. Once you get down to it, that you, it becomes very over validated when uh, mm. uh, after a certain point in your career. So. When did you become a journalist? So I was 20. What happened was that uh, I, 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 I was 19 when I finished my uh, graduation, local literature, because I was one year younger, right? Then um, I went to this uh, very bad journalism course in Madras Christian College. And uh, I had to fend for myself. So I had to collect the fees and all that. I just knew that I can't sustain this, you know. So I went to the principal and then uh, 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 I, some guy, when I was sitting in the canteen, he showed me this ad for Magna Publishing Company was interviewing people for journalists. So I went to the interview and uh, there were some 50 people, all adults, but somehow I got the job because I think Ingrid Albuquerque who hired me, she's a born, born again Christian. I don't know if she still likes that description. I'm sure she's fine with it. So she asked me if I believe in God, and I said no, and all that. I think she wanted to reform me. Oh. So that's how I think I got my job. This is my broad theory. And then I went to my college and asked for uh, my fees back. And I remember the principal, Gladstone, his name was. He shouted me, he started, he started screaming at me, I started laughing. It was a very funny moment, right? It's a poor guy goes to the principal, is asking the fees back, and the principal screams. So it was quite funny. And uh, even down the corridor, I could hear him scream, you know, even when I was leaving, that he found it so ridiculous. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, that was the end of uh, my attempt at uh, education. So when did you move from Madras to Delhi or Bombay, perhaps? Yeah. So when did you make that first move from village to the city? Village to the city, yeah. Uh, um, I was 21. Uh, Magna Publishing Company transferred me to Bombay, you know. And I land in this big city. Um, uh, it was it was quite dazzled. Something. I was in the sense that it lowered my standard. Like they they put me up in a chawl uh, when I landed. So it is very strange. Within one month, though I come from a village kind of Madras, Madras the village, you're used to space. Like everything is far from everything else. Mm -hmm. And within one month of coming to Bombay, Bombay had lowered my bar for living so much that my immediate ambition was not to become the great writer but to move into a flat <laughs> okay. a flat a real so flat that with attached became your toilet objective number 1 yes so i re i realized only much later that actually bombay really lowers the bar in many ways for that though i I enjoyed so my... So would you say manu that you actually also like the rest of us or most of us fell into the rut that you know moving from village to the city and then in city you need to have a flat and then you have to have a car then you have to have this fat package that you bring home and eventually you ended up in good gown <laughs> the, you know, yeah. you know. yeah. so do you feel that you somewhere actually fell into the same rut as everybody else yeah, but the only difference is I never compromise in the sense that they, I always like, for example, as a journalist, though I was struggling, I was hustling, and like most of us are hustlers, you know. Um, and this first dot com boom happened, you know. And I was still only 24, and I was, I was still, I mean, had to uh, fend for myself. And I never fell for those fancy salaries that they offered because by that I'd moved into Outlook, you know. And this was, I was very happy with the journalism that I was doing and I felt... At Outlook? Yeah. At that time, people, people, you know, that is the thing about, again, tradition, you know. And I can see why, uh, why institutions are so important to the West. Because people forget how great your past was if the present of that institution is unremarkable. You just wrote recently that it the BBC raid in Delhi in India reminded you of Outlook 2001 raid yeah. so would you say that what you knew then in 2001 and what you know now and the way you have evolved and grown do you have the same opinion about 
about these institutions now? BBC, maybe, because as many, in fact, once when I was in England, I, I, I was in BBC's office and I asked them, what is, what is the real BBC? Is it the TV or radio? How do, you, how do you identify yourself? And actually, they said that we, we ourselves don't know. BBC is everything. But I feel that, I mean, I, I like many aspects of BBC, you know, uh, because I, I like the news. I, I like... Uh, I mean, we, we, we can have complaints because we have grown up with them. But I like the fact that they are so serious about um, uh, what they are, okay? And, they're, and, and, and in, even in terms of fiction, you know, entertaining programs. It's not just journalism. If I'm not mistaken, Fleabag is a BBC production. It's one of my favorite series. Uh, so uh, I like all that. I like all that. Um, Outlook is a completely different story. But then, when story. when you when uh, as a reader, when you read Manu Joseph's essays in the last say decade, you get a sense that Manu Joseph has arrived at a point where he disbelieves everything that he believed in ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, you can say that. You uh, actually, I won't. Uh, that that would be a good observation in the sense that I'm not so much, a, uh, what I've lost is respect for many of the things. I, I, used to, I used to be stingy with my respect, and once I give respect, then I'm invested in that respect, right? And then when you, when, you, know, when you start working, like New York, I've, I've written for New York Times as a columnist for six years, yes. okay? And I did have a great editor, but, Eventually, uh, I, I did have to encounter an editor whom you know I, I could not respect. I told him, okay, and we lasted only one column, and I've not told this to anybody, you know. So what happened? Like, what was the disagreement? Over? It was actually quite simple. I uh, I had a great editor, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, she was in Hong Kong, and and uh, they assigned a new editor in London, and I just didn't like the way my column was edited. So I just told him, you know, uh, very politely that uh, why should changes be made when they're not necessary? And that led to a mail where I just didn't like the tone. You know, it's the tone which, uh, yes. you know, which I like, what did I say? I'm a columnist from India and I'm just telling you that, you know, this is not required. So, was it possible that they were unhappy with your opinions? Because it seems that Manu Joseph in the 2000s, Manu Joseph in the 2010s, they are two different voices. Is it possible that they did not like your opinions? Your shift perhaps from being a left liberal to perhaps moving to the center? I don't know. I think that that's an organization which would have just told you if they don't like you. There's no reason why they should be so shy, you know, because everybody wants to write for them. And but is this an assumption, or do you really know that that's what time New York Times does generally? Like they tell people that we don't like your opinions. Maybe, uh, yeah. I mean, if they have a problem with the column, you know, they can. There was never, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there was never an argument uh, over. Uh, a column which turned out, you know, except uh, until they changed the editor. In fact, I lasted so, two columns with them. The first column, I did have some kind of uh, an argument over, uh, you know, uh, over some aspects, you know. And the next column was purely on the editing. It had got nothing to do with, uh, with the ideology, you know. So if they had a problem from before, uh, I was not aware of it, and uh, they have not told me. You know, if there's, if there was one of those whispers which happened in the in the past. But now that a lot of information about ideological biases, the kind of fabrications and manipulations media organizations have done in the last several decades, it's all coming out. It's in the public domain. Do you now feel? that, you know, everything that you were doing at the NYT actually did not fit? You know, uh, I, 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 can, I get the broad substance of what you're saying, but 
I found my uh, I found the liberals to be nastier, you know, than uh, uh, than my right wing friends. Right, like a strange thing about life is that people who sound very nice on the social media uh, are some kind of jerks in real life. While the right wing, they sound so bad on social media most of the time. But they're actually quite wonderful people when you meet them, you know. I'm usually suspicious of such neat symmetries also, mm -hmm. but it baffles me and how, uh, how, how often I see this phenomenon, you know. When, there when, was was that, word, when was that point? What was that point when you felt that, oh, you have finally arrived as a writer? You know, I, I, I thought I arrived as a, as a writer when I was 18 also, but I just didn't know. Okay? I just thought that, oh, I'm so good and all that kind of stuff because you got five compliments, okay? That, uh, but I would say in a very mature way, I, was, I would say that uh, the publication of Serious Men, though I did feel that way with Outlook actually, that was the golden, last of the golden age of journalism when actually everybody who could read, read you, you know? And people will find it hard to believe the reactions which I could sense or get to a printed magazine article was even more than what I sense from my online columns, right? Um, so, so, what, so uh, identify this golden age of journalism in India? I would say the last of the years of golden age when I joined uh, Outlook when I was 24, so 98, 1998, I would say the last last one or two years of the golden age of magazine journalism, I would say, had just started. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, because very simply, you were read. You know, people took an effort to go and buy magazines. But people if... waited for magazines. People knew you. And, and... So you, you're being nostal nostalgic about, again, glamour and self-glory, if I'm... No, that's to, true. to call it. Yeah. So, but if you were looking at it very objectively, and uh, the reason actually my generation got to know Manu Joseph was uh, the radio tapes that you allowed to publish. Now, my point is this, that if you look back this glorious period, the last, let's say, of the golden age of journalism, was it really objective? Was it really neutral? Was it really giving space to all ideas and arguments? No, it was very liberal uh, uh, because people, I told you, they were the cultural orphans. Like we were all the cultural orphans. We were all emerging from a place where the West had uh, inadvertently marketed itself very well as uh, moral and an intellectual force, but more importantly, what our patriots don't understand, you know, is that all that is fine, okay, they marketed themselves very well, but they're also useful, okay? Everything they touched was lucrative. Yes. You know, and they could take care of you, and they were nice, generally, you know, until there was a problem and then you were surprised to see another side of them. But I think there's a lot of effort from their side uh, to be nice because it's very expensive in the West not to be nice. So that whole culture is built on a certain niceness and you just feel we, that we, it works. Uh, pardon me, we're talking about the culture when we say that you know, they built on this niceness. Where does this really come from? Because uh, if we look at their history, millions were killed in World War II, millions were killed in World War I. Uh, Interwars in the West, you know, Europe, between European nations, so many of them, so many conflicts. Uh, what do you really mean by this culture of niceness? Oh, there are two different, uh, two distinct niceness uh, uh, about the West, right? One is their political niceness, which comes from their argument, okay, which is, comes from the Christian uh, moral argument that even when they're going to kill you, they have to make the argument, okay, uh, which could be bullshit, but 
a certain niceness emerges from the moral pressure to explain yourself. It's a Christian ruse, like, you know, when they would colonize. Justification. Before for... annihilating a tribe, this guy will ask in Latin to tribals, you know, do you accept God? Okay, they have no idea what he's saying. Okay, and then they will go kill them, right? It's part of the argument building, the necessity to build a moral argument. So that is where the political niceness comes from. The social niceness comes from, I feel, the greater social equality, you know, the swag that even the poor are allowed to have. I see even Manu Joseph doing that uh, a bit. For example, many uh, men who are meninists instead of feminists, and you have a very strong case against feminists, Meninous, that's a word? <laughs> that apparently is a word. <laughs> okay. Uh, look up to you and you justify, say, meninism. And uh, you even went to the extent of justifying, or let's, let me be more politically correct. You wrote a piece in defense of Tarun Tejpa. I don't agree that's a defense. In fact, I, uh, uh, at the time when uh, the piece was uh, published. Among the first people to tweet that piece was the young woman in the, in the center of the whole controversy. So for that piece, I had uh, naturally interviewed Tarun and uh, I interviewed the young woman also. And uh, when the piece was immediate, one hour after the piece was shared online, the young woman herself tweeted and, uh, and the lawyer, and her lawyer uh, sent me a message saying that that's, it's a fine balanced piece. Uh, then for some reason, uh, at that time, being neutral uh, in a case like this, like a Me Too, it was, it was our first big Me Too case. Maybe it was beyond Me Too, right? Um, the, the two things happened, which was all within three or four hours, is that, first of all, this neutral business is not working. Okay, either you take a stand at favoring uh, the woman, okay, who is the who was called victim in all the publications. Or she identified woman. herself as a victim. Can you take that right from her? Can you take that right from any woman? I mean, we're not Pakistan where you actually need to give uh, three witnesses to prove uh, that you ha are a victim of sexual abuse. Yes, but for journalistic organizations to keep calling a young woman victim Victim, victim, young victim. It just sounds, Why? I mean, honestly, from an es even from an aesthetic point of view, it just sounds silly, you know. Forget the, you know. F uh, what is aesthetics in, in a case where a woman is feeling victimized and feeling raped? What is aesthetically the right word for it? I, I just feel it's demeaning to call, uh, in fact, that was another problem with that piece, according to some people, because I kept yeah, referring to her as young. It was the first journalistic piece which referred to her as young woman, right? Because they thought that this guy is using language to manipulate, okay, opinion, okay? But that I find very am amusing because all these people, all these people, including the young woman and the lawyers and everybody else, they were part of Tarun Tejpal's social circle and they would know the fact that till, till date, okay, till, till at that point, they had never seen me in any of his parties, his office, home, where they were present. I was not part of his social circle. In fact, the only person I had a problem with an outlook was Tarun Tejpal, who was quite a jerk to me, okay, because he was my boss. But so it is quite ironic to me that they throw this accusation at me that I was trying to help a friend, and they know that they have never that seen me. That he was not your social. friend. Fair enough. So that actually gives us this impression that Manu Joseph is fundamentally a contrarian who loves or draws some kind of perverted pleasure when people hate him. I when completely no, you like you like when you like when people hate you. There's nothing that kinky about me at all, you know. I, I just feel that uh, maybe if at all I'm guilty of something, it is that as a writer, I feel some things are interesting, you know? And there is a conflict inside me on whether 
my uh, the, the the fact that I take note of what is interesting, whether that is something I some something that restrains me as a writer, uh, or it frees me as a writer, or it gives me clarity as a writer. Okay, because I know how to write two thousand words on that cushion and how many and different ways to tap it and call it anthropology. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it won't, may not be so bad, but I do find it interesting. So, so there's a lot of so, things that you can do, and I did find this story interesting, and I felt that a lot of writers who didn't write this were just cowards. You can call, you can- Oh, you, you so can, the word coward, so that brings us to another position that you like to challenge the positions which are generally not challenged by most writers, and you think that there is a certain uh, bravery or courage involved to challenge such a position. And in a way, Manu Joseph is looking for admiration or um, admiration for his bravery. After a point, admi it's, admiration doesn't drive you in the sense that I'm not, I'm not 20, right? You, what you're doing is, uh, as, as, a, as a writer, you, uh, you just want to do what you want to do, and if there are forces which stops you, uh, you can either uh, be practical, that's, that's the word, when you, and not do it, or you can, be, uh, you, you, you can be annoyed with yourself for restraining yourself and just go ahead and do it. So, so m many of my stories, which are deemed controversial, or even opinions or columns, uh, are just things which I have felt like doing, and I and and because I I am so confident of my moral compass, okay, that I have uh, a a fair understanding of myself. Uh, I just don't feel the need to pretend, you know, that in, in, I think I'm also naive in the sense that I feel that most people will see that I'm not doing something evil. I didn't do something evil, okay, that I said something or I did something because that I believe is what I do. Are there forces which are trying to prevent, prevent you from writing yeah, uh, certain totally. ideas? Yeah, totally, totally. And they're part of my liberal friends, right? Okay. Because for some reason, I mean, I, I'm sure the right wing also has the capacity to do it, and there are other writers who face this. For, but for some reason, uh, there are these, these standard guys who are in particular places for the last 10 years. Uh, well, again, there, there are many reasons they, they do it, but let's check the interesting reasons. That's why interesting gives us the clarity, right? One of the reasons which people usually don't talk about why why the the liberal uh, the liberal, liberal male feminists suddenly this, this this guy has such strong views protecting women and such strong views against anybody who says anything so it's a part of some kind of a competition an imagined sexual competition that uh, these guys are are in you know hmm. and it also emerges from a certain uh, collegiate emotion now, what has happened to a lot of guys from my generation is that the best time of their life was in college, okay? Because they were nothings, and then in college they found some ideology, they, maybe they got some girls, or they got some fame. They've ca extended the college period <laughs> into their professional life. So mm -hmm. I call, that's why I call them college. They're college in the right sense. They never grew up because they, that was the best time of their life. They were very proud of their ideology, their climate change shit, their feminism shit. Okay? So you don't and believe especially in climate change. So you don't believe in climate change. There are, there is a litany, there are litany of charges against you. You, um, you have something against climate change. Uh, it is not that I don't champions. believe in any of this. They, you have something against feminists. You have something against those who love sugar and deserts. You have so much against so many people. You, many people think you actually don't like people. You don't <laughs> want to see people. I, I, I completely disagree. It's not that I don't, 
I don't believe in climate change. I feel that it just comes under belief, you know. So there is belief. I don't think so it's become there like are different a kinds of belief. Belief is one thing, and then depending on circumstance and personality, people. Find. That's why I find very amusing this new term which has come about climate, uh, climate anxiety. Anxiety. So again, for mainstream. Uh, organization to promote this nonsense. The danger is that if you're not going to, these people, if it was not climate, they would have been anxious about something else or something else. So why, so these, this kind of labeling to me so you, is you, kind of endorsing something which may not be true. You're referring to alarmists. No, these people are not alarmists. They feel that they are very anxious about climate and uh, when you start labeling things like climate anxiety, people are unable to reach into themselves and find out what is bothering them and what is going to bother them for the rest of their lives because a false label is given. So you're to what saying they feel. that most of the activists out there in the world, they have some disorder, there's something, <laughs> something, something happening at a psychiatric level that they need to address. I would say the 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 influential ones. I think it can help them, okay, in, in the field of activism. You mean to say Goethe Thunberg? No, not, not just her. I just don't want to take a specific name. But I just feel, because I don't know these people personally, I just feel from my experience generally, I just feel Al that Gore. the... Uh, <laughs> I, feel the I feel that having a, 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 a mental condition, you know, again, I don't want to use the word disorder or disability as I didn't use it for spirituality, because I don't know if it actually stops them from doing something. In fact, I feel that it helps them in this case. Complete neutrality and sanity, you know, it's, how can it help you? You know, you, you need You're a certain You're also against feminists. 100% not, 100% not. You know, I just feel that they, they, uh, they, uh, they, they want, they don't want some things to be addressed, sometimes because I don't know. It's uh, it's it it makes them uncomfortable that a few things are mentioned. You know, like for example, I I, I recently argue uh, I argued in a column that actually the column was about how wherever I go I go, women say that they don't like men. So what does that mean, right? What does it mean for us, right? Because if women genuinely don't like men, and they don't like the men specifically or they don't like the concepts of both ways. Why are men seeing you as somebody who is going to save the male species in the world? They're looking up to you as if you really are a meninist and the world really needs more meninist than feminist. If they have that view, they're going to be very disappointed. And uh, Are you, you a know, meninist or a fem feminist? See, I'm a... I'm a uh, I am... Um, I'm a writer. Okay. Okay. So I feel that writers and can't a prankster be you also. and a prankster too. When yeah, you know, like for example, if I want to say that uh, uh, that uh, ninety nine percent of Indian men have not had the opportunities that uh, Indian feminists who use terms like patriarchy use. I can understand that it's irritating, but I am from that 99%. I am from that, uh, that yeah. social background where we had to struggle and we saw the top 1% talk about being victims, you know. And uh, so, so when I question that is this whole thing a battle of the second per, of the 98th percentile against the 99th percentile, I think uh, the, I, 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 a lot of women do accept that there is, a, there, is, there is an argument to be made and we can discuss these things. What is the problem? You also have something against people who eat asparagus, uh, avocados, anchovies, um, I eat and all artichoke. This, by the way, I, must say, I eat all this. It's just that I find uh, it, it, sometimes as a writer, it's very useful to have labels. And I just don't want to call them liberals. And I used to call them all through my 20s, actually. I used to call them salad eaters. And now I realize now everybody's eating salads. It's not a left liberal thing. So I, I, I call them asparagus eaters. 
because it's just it's just convenient. But there is a certain disdain for this class, isn't it? You are a classist <laughs> of a different kind. You have a, you have disdain for the upper class. I would say I'm a bit amused, and uh, I just uh, uh, I just feel that um, uh, it I I just feel that the. Uh, their projection of themselves as the underclass sometimes is completely undeserving. And uh, so I just enjoy myself sometimes, you know, just amu I just amuse myself by pointing out that they are being absurd. Having uh, been following your nonfiction work, if anyone was following you, one would say that, that you are now you are talking um, mostly on the issues which kind of are non-liberal or anti-liberal uh, issues, like anti-liberal arguments. Were you a liberal to begin with and you grew up being an anti-liberal or non-liberal over time? Probably you can say that I was bit on the liberal side because you are trained to believe in a certain decorum uh, in, in journalism and writing and uh, you, uh, you f for instance, people don't realize it, until recently you believed as a citizen and as a writer and as a journalist that voting is a moral act, that, that people uh, people elect or people do things uh, out of a sense of goodness, you know. At some, I, I, at some level, I would have known this is absurd, okay, but I feel that I surrendered my rationality to an idea that people are generally good and only good things should happen. So that is all there is to my, uh, you know, uh, so you can say you become you become past. you become more cynical. I would say that uh, I become more curious to to poke a bit more and and see what is uh, what is going on. You know, um, see even when I covered the post Gujarat uh, riots uh, as a reporter for Outlook. Um, there was a moment where I felt that some of the stories of people who suffered were exaggerations. Okay. But you did feel that? Some, in some case, I mean, there was genuine suffering, but I'm, I was, I think I was 27 or something, so I found this kind of, so I told Vinod Mehta uh, that this is happening, and the magazine felt that it is just not right to, to carry something like that in, in, in that context. So, uh, when, as a reporter, I was a bit disappointed, but now actually I understand that as a sense of decency, you know, so maybe purely from an objective point of view, as a journalistic point of view, you can have arguments against it. But if at all there are flaws in the theory of, of what is called liberalism, the actual high quality one, you know, not this, you know, this woke bullshit which is going on, it is that it is the group of people trying to be decent you know, uh, in fast, fast changing situations, you know. I feel that like the idea of money, decency also gives you some clarity, you know, uh, in a life that is hard to understand. So now we have come to the rapid fire section of this program. I'm going to give you two choices, you'll have to pick one. And you will have to explain the reason why you chose what you chose, liberal or conservative? Conservative. Why? Because I can accept that people uh, can be flawed and, uh, and people, can, uh, people don't have to emerge uh, from, from a certain moral or a moral compass, you know, that people can feel like villagers. Actually, more importantly, that 99% of, uh, of, of 
how people think is never articulated. And these are not bad people. They just have great thoughts. Men or women? Women. Why? I just like them. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> sugar or salt? Salt. Why? Because I, I think sugar kills a lot of people. And I can if at all I can become an evangelist, it is that uh, sugar is completely unnecessary. And uh, the all kinds of it can lead to all kinds of. Problems. But then, so uh, I, but then you in one of your pieces you actually said that it's the natural, the innate drive of human species to go for sugar. Yes. Because you wouldn't eat boiled cauliflower. Yeah, I myself I enjoy sugar once uh, a week yeah. because it is it is uh, like most evil things. It's very enjoyable. You know, I'm not denying it. But uh, sugar can uh, influence people to, to intellectualize and be over compassionate with themselves. Asparagus or rice? Oh, rice. I'm from the south. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you're changing the logic. Rice is sugar. But compared to asparagus, because uh, the ri I, because I'm more fond of rice eaters than asparagus eaters. Gurgaon or Delhi? Gurgaon. Oh, I thought you hated Gurgaon. Yeah, but I hate Delhi more. I can never understand a single compliment about Delhi. First of all, I don't see Delhi. Delhi is a place which is behind walls. And most people who love Delhi are just the people who like the past. They are being nostalgic about their own lives. But they don't understand from an outsider's point of view, what do you see of Delhi? You know, it's like everything is behind something. Arvind Kejriwal or Mani Sisodia in Delhi? Kejriwal. Why? Because uh, Kejriwal is uh, the future of, you know, uh, the, uh, the, in the future there are going to be two Hindu parties. So one will be the BJP's but version I of the Hindu But I thought party. that Congress and the BJP were also Hindu parties, no? The DNA of Congress is not Hindu. They are just saying it because they are losing. They can also call them a South Indian party and you would be probably more right. So they can say what they want. But actually, Arvind Kejriwal is probably the guy who would know the Hanuman Chalisa. And I would probably suspect that actually Narendra Modi is he may not know the Hanuman Chalice. You never know. Oh, he may not but be Kejriwal the would? Kejriwal, 100% he would. Okay, not that I know the uh, Hanuman Chalice, but I'm just saying that when, when as, a, as a Hindu party, this guy is a temple goer. You know, he's that kind of, you know. Is, so, so, yeah. So, I find, uh, I find them interesting because uh, if they manage to survive this phase, which they may not, so they, so they could be the second Hindu party and they can, uh, they, they, they can at least pretend or, or project themselves as the moderate So you are saying party. that there won't be any party for Christians, Muslims, other minorities? You know, uh, I have a dramatic theory. I think what, what could happen as BJP tries to become very strong in every way. Uh, South India is going to be the key. Now, the BJP looks like it's strong in Karnataka. But I feel that it just takes a South Indian Modi to rise and ask the uncomfortable question, if we can't touch these guys in the north, should the south be a different entity? Okay, This is going to be the consequence in the next 20 years. If you are going to be so strong that any kind of a dissent will end, will end up in prison, then I feel that there's something about the South that North Indians just don't get. Okay, so the lot of these theories in the North are not going to work in the South. It just takes a little, there's nobody there, nothing is in the horizon. And I also feel that the theory is, sounds a bit ludicrous even to me right now. But I think there is a small chance in the next 20 years that, uh, uh, that, that you know, there could be some interesting things going on there. Amit Shah or Yogi? Amit Shah. Oh, why? I read somewhere once that he puts his head on his, he used to put his head on his mom's lap and they used to have conversations. 
Okay, I don't know where I read this. That's the reason? It is a very endearing image of a person who is perceived to be dangerous. I just found it, find it very dramatic and I have a feeling that I kind of get him, I know him, you know, but Yogi is a completely, uh, Yogi is a person with whom I will not be able to fully communicate, you know, but I feel that I will be able to write Amit Shah in fiction. I would be able to go inside his mind and he will say, boss, 50% has got me. But Yogi, I won't be able to write him. V.S. Naipaul or Salman Rushdie? Naipaul. Why? Naipaul tried to be that person who just wanted to get at the facts of the human condition, you know, uh, what is going on. And he didn't care about how he was perceived. As much, I think everybody cares to some extent. And uh, uh, he, uh, of course, his writing was in generalization. In a more naive period, he, he was more accepted. Uh, but I feel that his, he is a writer who had the gift of intuition. And intuition is not a paranormal force. It's a subterranean knowledge which you immediately connect and you don't even know why you arrived at a conclusion. Uh, but I feel that Naipaul had a better chance at being right about uh, human beings because he had also liberated himself from the moral compass. Virginia Woolf or Toni Morrison? I would say Toni Morrison. Why? It is just that as a literature student, I had to read Virginia Woolf and it just creates a unnecessary bias, to be honest, because you're too young and you're just in the wrong age and a cultural space to read. Global citizen or Indian? Global citizen. Why? I want to run by a river, clean air. I want those, I want the, I want the ordinary things which seem like luxuries in India and the way where we are going, we're going to be very prosperous in the next five years. I tell everybody just invest in the mutual funds, get, get, put your money in good stock. But we're not going to improve our quality of life dramatically immediately, you know. And what matters to me right now is that anyway I'm an outsider anywhere, you know. So might as well run in a, a beautiful place. And you therefore have a better outlook for the rest of the world? No, I don't have a better outlook for the world. Uh, I just feel that um, I can just slip through the cracks there and uh, survive. Thank you so much for being with us, Manu Jagaf. It was a delight. Thank you so much. I enjoyed myself.